and begin now. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll be doing the uh, intro to DevOps with GitHub today. So in this session, I'm going to be helping you to understand more about what's available as part of GitHub to help you with your DevOps practices. So to begin, my name is Ken Muse. I'm the VP of Professional Services at Wintelect and at Masera Company. If you haven't heard of us, we provide consulting, instructor-led and on-demand training, as well as managed hosting for Azure environments. We're a Microsoft Gold partner in multiple areas, as well as a GitHub partner. If you have heard of us, then most likely it's because you've either seen one of our books, attended one of our trainings, or read one of our blog posts to help you learn how to do uh, technical development more efficiently and effectively. In today's session, we're going to be doing an introduction to DevOps with GitHub. And so we're gonna begin by just a very brief high level, uh, what is DevOps itself? And then an introduction to GitHub, and then a walkthrough of, at a high level, some of the features in GitHub that you can specifically use to improve your DevOps practices and embrace DevOps. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end, so feel free to add questions as we go to the uh, question board, and we'll make sure to get to all those as we get to the end. This session will be a high-level overview, and we will be available afterwards for people that would like to go deeper into some of the topics, and we would encourage you to continue to uh, keep in touch so that you can attend future webinars where we do go deeper into some other subjects as well. So to begin with, when we're talking about DevOps, what do we mean? Often this is viewed as different things by different people. Some will say that DevOps is really about automation. Others will say it's practices around Scrum and Agile. In truth, everyone often has a slightly different view, but the basic premise is very simple. At its root, it really is Instead of development and operations being treated as different organizations within a company, and development may be further subdivided into other teams that are each in their own silo, the word literally is the bringing together of development and operations as a unified body. That is one team working towards one goal. And so the idea of simply handling automation or simply implementing Scrum, uh, making a more fluid interaction with a, an independent QA team. In truth, DevOps is really bringing it all together in a way that makes the collective team, and then even above that, the entire company holistically more productive and more scalable. You'll often see the uh, word DevOps shown with an infinity symbol. And part of the reason behind this is it really reflects that key culture that it's all one big practice with no beginning and no end. And wherever it starts, it also comes back to. And there's no real hard boundary in the ideal practice between the different teams. We're all one company with one goal. And so we have a basic circle of life in this regards with DevOps, where at the highest level, we're really moving from planning to development of the code. And as the code gets developed, it's pushed and built. And as the code's built, it's then moved into a deployment environment or multiple environments where we can now analyze it better. And to do that, of course, we have monitoring, not just the application of the servers, but also the interactions between the different components, the performance. At the highest level, DevOps incorporates people, processes, and tools, generally in that order, with each of the processes uh, being able to be represented either uh, circularly or connected. And in 
every state, we're assuming that testing and quality are part of every single one of these practices and a key value that joins all the teams together. So instead of a separate team that says, hey, this is where the value prop is, typically what we're saying is in order for us to have quality, we have to begin with how we plan it all the way through to how does the customer receive it, incorporating all those aspects. When we do this at scale and with the best uh, approaches and practices, we'll typically see bettering operating better operating efficiencies, higher quality outcomes. We'll see small batches of releases getting fast feedback focused on customer satisfaction. We'll be aligned towards uh, a set of goals for the organization and a mission all targeting trying to bring the most value to the customer, and this happening with increased collaboration. And so to bring all of these pieces together, the people are critical because we need everyone working as a team. The processes are critical. We need it to be efficient and effective. And the tools are important because ultimately the tools have to support the people and the processes to get this job done. And that's where GitHub fits in. GitHub is a very well-known and very well-regarded application lifecycle management tool that enables many of these DevOps practices. It's got a high number of users around the globe, over 56 million by the end of last year. And if someone's coming out of a college or out of most companies, they'll have not only heard of GitHub, they may have actively been using it. And because of its high focus on integration, security, and lifecycle management, it's also an incredibly good tool at helping you to identify and remediate security vulnerabilities as part of that quality process that your teams are trying to implement. And that's part of why most of your Fortune 50 are actively using GitHub to do their development. GitHub can also integrate with a number of other offerings that support DevOps, and that seamless integration story means that ultimately it becomes the hub that unites your tools to support your people and your processes. So stepping back just a bit to cover what is GitHub, it really all begins around the story of Git a decentralized version control system. What that means is that we're all agreeing to use GitHub or a similar system as our reference point. We all agree that that's a system of record, but ultimately the development actually happens locally with local commits, local checkouts, local enhancements, enabling developers to experiment and really focus on what they're trying to accomplish with the least possible impediments. In this model, there's really no single source of truth because we may all have full copies of the repository. If you attended our session two weeks ago, you know that there's an ability to go uh, in a quite wide range in that area between copying an entire repository and just parts of it. But that's really part of how the overall distributed development practice works, is that you can choose what you need, when you need it, work on it locally, and then present it back to the agreed upon system of record. And because you have this level of flexibility, branching, which is usually a huge pain point for teams working with centralized version control, is now key to the model and easily incorporated into the processes, which means you can support higher levels of code churn without having to impact everyone on the team's development process. The nature of Git is also such that it was designed from the beginning to be incredibly performant. At the end of the day, branching, merging, committing code, if we're spending our time waiting on these processes to complete, we're not spending our time bringing value to our customers. And so Git enables all of these core pieces. 
And recognizing that, GitHub actually built an entire platform around Git, which brings the rest of the application lifecycle management into one place so that it becomes a holistic journey. So instead of being just your code, now you can also handle things like how do we manage issues? How do we collaborate? How do we track bugs, new feature requests, project plans? If we're committing code as a team, how do we put some governance around it with pull requests and the ability to perform code reviews so we can understand how we improve our best practices? With the addition of GitHub Actions, we now have an end-to-end -end story around how we build our code and how GitHub can be used to deploy the code into production environments. The new project plan functionality, uh, projects, gives us a way of looking at our issues and backlog differently. We can use it to manage how things will change over time, or we can use it as a Kanban board to allow us to move things between states and observe that transition as part of our life cycle. In fact, GitHub themselves uses that methodology as a way of helping the community to see their roadmap. They publish everything as a project. And as they move things between the swim lanes, we can see where it is in their current planning and when that feature might be coming out. To further enable collaboration, sometimes we need the ability to just simply read some documentation. And so incorporating an integrated wiki and markdown support allows the team to bring that together in one place. Without, uh, with all this incorporated together, of course, security becomes paramount, but not just security in terms of accessing the code. We also need security around the code itself, because as we write code in the modern development paradigm, we're going to be using third-party, frequently open source dependencies. And those dependencies can be the source of exploits that ultimately could impact our code base. So having integrated engines that can scan the code, identify potential issues, and let you know when your dependencies themselves have problems. Because this is a team exercise, we also wanna bring in insights, graphs that I'll talk about in a moment that help us to understand who's doing what when. And then finally, package management. And this is a very broad term because it encompasses things like a Docker repository where I can track the images and make them available. NPM, uh, node package management, so that my JavaScript dependencies can be centralized. NuGet. These kind of packages uh, help us to manage the way we develop our code and centralize how we distribute the code to the rest of the team. It can be part of a release process, and it can be part of the process that enables us to have faster development cycles. Uh, this will lead directly into some of the questions that I can see people are asking. And so we'll dive a little deeper into that part as we get to the end of today's session. So our journey really begins with how do we track requests? And in GitHub, one of the key ways that we can track requests is through issues. Issues are a way of understanding what's happening or needs to change with our code. It's a very broad terminology in the GitHub space that can incorporate new feature requests, bugs, enhancements. All of these different terms roll up under the term issues inside of GitHub. Now, in the original flavor of GitHub, issues were simply uh, a very lightweight way of coordinating around these activities. You had a title, you had a description. Ultimately, as changes were made, they were associated with the issue number so that we could track the life cycle of the changes over time and know when the issue was resolved, whether it was we've added that new feature or we've resolved that bug. But over time, this overall practice has been improved and enhanced. And so 
now we've got other ways of looking at issues because everything is templatable. So to quickly switch over to a different screen, if I move over here to my repository, I can actually create templates using Markdown or YAML, uh, the YAML support being a newer feature that just came out, so that I can better define the differences between the types of data I wanna track and even create forms for those. And so beyond the simple issue tracking of the, the title and description and then the collaboration on it, I can actually empower my team to be able to create very descriptive and collaborative input fields that help us to move forward on the problem. And so if I go over here to issues, you can see I can click new issue. And those three files, the markdown and the two YAML, are exposed here in a way that allows me to quickly create a customized issue. Now, if none of these work, I can always return to the, the standard template for an issue. The markdown support is very similar to the standard template, but I can start to pre-populate some of the content to make it easy to understand what do I need to capture for this bug issue. You can see that it's already got a pre-formatted title that matches my team's convention, and that if I start filling in uh, the content in this description area, it's really all being formatted with Markdown, and so it makes it quick and easy to read to understand what we're trying to get out of this so we can move it forward. Markdown is a first-class citizen in almost every part of GitHub, and so you become very comfortable with those syntaxes if you aren't already. And of course, you can use some tools to help automatically format things if that makes it easier. But we can also use the new YAML support that was just released and is in beta to allow us to create more complex issues. For example, my new feature here. You'll notice that instead of being simple markdown, now I've got a form that actually captures more data in the way I might want to see it. For example, a checkbox to say whether uh, an existing request of the same type exists, a markdown field that I can enter freeform text in, a dropdown field where I can provide certain values. And all of this is ultimately managed as code, which I can put governance around, and which I can edit. And so one of the great things about this new approach is that with an understanding of basic YAML, and without a need to understand complex XML or some of the other ways that we would create work items in the past, I can actually create very descriptive types of content that can be tracked in issues, filtered on, optimized and organized to support my teams. You'll notice that I can even label items as they're created, triage, bug, feature, so that as an issue is created, it's automatically labeled, sortable, filterable. No extra actions required on the part of the team. I can also, add assignments here if I choose, so that certain types of issues always go to certain key people to be reviewed. Now, as I mentioned, this feature is currently in beta, and so uh, it is a brand new feature that is still being developed, still being enhanced, but hopefully you can see just out of the box, it provides quite a bit of power without having to spend a lot of time. And so the first step of our journey into DevOps begins with how we plan, how we create those backlogs, how we log these issues so we can begin organizing them. And as you can see, everything is now becoming something we can template, including as we get into code, the pull request process. Now I mentioned that one way we can filter and organize issues and content within GitHub is through the use of labels. Labels give us an easy way to 
categorize things that have similar relationships or to create ways of cataloging uh, elements that are going to need some level of automation. I can actually use labels to drive actions through the system. And so we can create labels in GitHub that help us to support these processes. So that whether it's a bug, a dependency, an enhancement, we can quickly search on it and find it instead of just simply relying on searching the text or the title. And so if your team prefers to rely on namespacing in the title of an issue, such as the word bug, to identify bugs, of course they can. But labels give us a more powerful way that we can group things together, search on them, identify them, and work through things. In fact, we might even create labels that indicate specific next steps or specific uh, targets. When combined with uh, another similar labeling feature like milestones, we can start beginning uh, to organize each of these items into a timeline. Where will it be worked? When will it be worked? Who will be working it? And again, with each of these issues that we create, it starts a dialogue. The entire team, everyone that shares that organization and has permission to that repository, can collaborate, can add comments, feedback, submit pull requests and, and code changes to help move things forward. And labels just give us a way of organizing all of those so that we can find things better. Now, as we as GitHub has moved forward, they've realized that this isn't the only thing people need. Sometimes we need other ways to pivot on the data, or we need a way to organize the data beyond just tagging it. And so there's a new feature that was just announced that'll be coming uh, in the future, the tables and boards. This is currently in a preview state, but it's going to take this and give you yet another option for how you make your teams effective. Because again, the process should, should be supported by the tool. And so this is going to allow you to define new ways of organizing your issues and your plans to make things more actionable, to enable you to get more visibility and to then be able to carry things forward more effectively. It's going to tie together a lot of these individual pieces in a more holistic and visible way. So this feature is currently in preview. You can sign up to be added to a wait list to begin to explore it yourselves. And GitHub has published a roadmap where this will eventually make its way out into the real world. So coming back to part of where we started, all of this planning, all of these features, ultimately are around supporting some sort of code level activity, whether it's infrastructure as code or your application code. You're looking at needing the repository support in GitHub as a way of organizing all that code together and being able to work on it as a team. Everything that you check in or commit can be associated to issues, to pull requests, to other parts of the process. And so you can actually see what drove the change, what was implemented as part of the change, and ultimately where that change ended up and when it ended up out on a given server or in an environment. One of the keys to supporting that is the ability to create branches, both on the server and at the individual local repository level. GitHub provides this support, uh, both through the standard Git mechanisms, as well as through an easy to use interface, which allows us to go in through the web portal and quickly switch between branches, view them, or type a new branch name and create a branch on the fly. By being able to navigate between the different branches, we can actually create branches for various features and we can see the history and changes to the branches over time. I can see which branches I'm involved with that have been uploaded, as well as which ones may have gone stale 
that is, they're no longer getting uh, constant updates and are ready to be let go. Ideally, most of your branches are going to be short-lived. And so they'll live for a while locally. They'll live for a short time through a pull request process inside of GitHub. And then eventually they'll be removed with everything tracking back to the main branch. So as you've got a single source of what is stability. So between the web portal and the fact that most modern tools support branches as a first class citizen, you've got an immediate way to begin managing and dealing with the code base to create new development, new features, and new functionality. GitHub also provides us an easy way to look through all the commits that are happening in a branch and throughout the repository at any moment in time. Who's making the change? What's the commit ID? What are the differences between this commit and the one before it? How does this all happen over time? So it gives us visibility into the entire life cycle of the code. So now we've gone from the issue being defined to code being checked in against that, to being able to review that code, to understand what's changed, does it comply, is it within our best practices? Repositories themselves also have some additional features that help support DevOps at scale. When we have multiple repositories, we're going to want to have practices that are common between the teams. You've already seen how issues can be standardized. Pull requests follow a similar process. But one of the more powerful features that GitHub also offers is the ability to take a standardized repository with your issues defined, with your practices embedded and created, uh, pull request templates, branches, and promote it to being a repository template. By creating a repository template, you can create uh, a repository that really is being used entirely to generate new repositories. And so as your teams create new repositories, they can clone uh, an existing template at the time of creation. And all of those features that you spent time creating as part of your other repositories now become part of this new one. You do have granular control because you may or may not want to include all of the branches. But again, because this is supporting your people and your process, the tool doesn't dictate that. It just simply gives you a mechanism for being able to personalize how your GitHub repositories are created by teams. Within these templates, I can have additional files that represent issue templates, PR templates, code owners, so who's allowed to make changes where, contribution guidelines, uh, what are our rules for how you contribute to the code base, and help to enforce certain key processes. I can even include actions, which we'll get into in a little bit, to enable teams to be effective in how they take on internal parts of the build process that we've defined ourselves. It's worth also mentioning that there are other uh, available features in this area, including the ability for individual developers to create a template, uh, the .files repository, that specifies how would they like to see their development environment laid out? What kind of configuration would they like to see? And this really comes into play when we start talking about code spaces. Code spaces allows us to take the code one level further. Instead of our code being in source control and visible as just text files in the repository, we can actually promote it and go one step further. With code spaces, we have the ability to actually interact with the code, changing it, creating new commits, branching on it entirely in the cloud. When Codespaces was first revealed, it was often talked about by a lot of developers as a way to run Visual Studio Code in the cloud. And that is to a large extent true because it is the Visual Studio Code environment 
which means all those features, functionality, and extensibility. It's natively integrated with the Git repository, which means all of the features and functionality of Git and GitHub. But it goes a step further. It actually integrates behind the scenes with Docker files that your team may define that specify what should the environment look like for the developer, what tools should be installed, what runtime should be there, what does deploying an app look like. In other words, your development environment now becomes infrastructure as code. So instead of being limited to infrastructure as code being purely the part of the deployment cycle, we're starting to pull that inward and make it easy to quickly stand up development environments that are consistent and where we need them to be fully hosted in the cloud. So if you needed to give five developers an ability to become effective day one at your company, this would allow them to hit the ground running with a fully configured development environment and the ability through those dot .file repos to begin to customize it and make it their own. As an additional feature uh, in all of this, you can also specify some of the configuration settings for the VS Code instance it's running so that you can ensure certain extensions are available, certain features are properly configured, so that the team has complete effectiveness out of the gate. All of that ties together with the ability to do local builds, except in this case, local means cloud local. The code compiles in a hosted instance. It can run in that instance, and you can actively debug it. You can create a web application or a web API, and when you start debugging it, it's going to create a private tunnel for you, allowing you to connect to that as if it was local on your machine, so you can now interact with it and debug it as if it was all running on your box but with all of those features hosted so you get the maximum performance out of it. And so this gives developers an end-to-end -end way to work with the code and interact with it beyond just the traditional source control support. So this adds a whole new dimension in the way we approach coding and distributing code among teams by allowing teams to be active from the beginning and create repeatable environments that they can use and share amongst themselves. There's another feature that I'd like to mention that's coming to uh, to GitHub. It's been getting a lot of press lately. It's also uh, currently being previewed, and that's Copilot. So for most teams, we're used to as we develop, there is some level of interaction with Google, Stack Overflow, other features and functionality to help us understand how to work with certain APIs or how to build certain types of patterns in code in the most effective way possible. Now, because we've been doing open source for so long, as a technical community, developers have made so many of these patterns, codes, paradigms available on the cloud, which is perfect for machine learning. When you combine that with all of the security infrastructure that's in GitHub for identifying security exploits, vulnerabilities, best practices, and you apply that machine learning to it, the output or the outcome of that is Copilot. The ability to describe what you're wanting to create and getting certain boilerplate functions coded for you automatically. Now, this doesn't uh, cover every use case. There are always lots of scenarios that developers will always still have to customize, but simple things like, how do I do a fetch in JavaScript? If I'm working with certain libraries, in this case, how do I make a call for sentiment analysis against that particular system? By starting to combine a little bit of that logic and a little bit of that knowledge with what we're trying to do, we can get a rough framework, or in some cases, complete code provided for us that can help us to better write our code. This means that even 
and experienced developers can have a little bit of additional assistance through machine learning to help them improve their coding practices and to help them get started. As this becomes further integrated into GitHub, I think we're gonna see additional enhancements and additional ways that this can make developers more productive. But this is a new feature, it is just rolling out and it does have a private wait list. So it's gonna be very exciting to see where this goes and how it enables teams to be more effective in trying to find those code snippets that we use all the time and how we can take best practices that the system is beginning to learn about each language and apply it directly to our code. The next step in the developer lifecycle with this is gonna be the pull request, the ability to put some level of governance around our code. So when a developer finishes creating the code for the feature or the bug fix on their local box, or they create a portion of that and they're ready to share it with the team, either to start collaborating on the solution, to get a review, or because they believe they've really completed everything. A pull request gives us the ability to say, I want a workflow around that. When a developer pushes a branch up to GitHub and makes it available to the greater team, I wanna make it go through a process of checks and approvals before it's allowed to be committed into main. And so I can define those practices, those processes in GitHub and say that in order for this commit to make its way to main, I need at least one person to review it and say, yes, they believe the code is done right. I have a checklist that I want them to follow and I need them to assert that they've actually completed all of the items in the checklist. I may have automated builds and tests or perhaps a remote sonar cube system or other scanner that's going to review that code to look for possible mistakes or security exploits. And so I'm gonna run a series of checks to automatically evaluate the code and provide feedback. And as we go through this process, the developer is gonna learn from the rest of the team and from the automation and improve their best practices. Ultimately, by going through a workflow process like this, it gives us some level of, governments to of governance to define what does it mean to be complete? What does it mean to be done? This goes back to an old principle in Agile of having a clear definition of done not just for issues, but also for what does it mean at the code level? What does it mean to have a piece of code in a working state? And does the team agree? This is a two-way conversation, or actually a multi-way, where the team can collaborate, where additional commits can be pushed up, and where corrections can be made. We can even go a step further in this process, and we have the ability to interact directly with the commit to annotate the code. Instead of just saying, hey, you really should think through this part of the process better, I can actually open up one of the changes and begin marking up the code to provide that feedback directly in line to help the developer get through the process more rapidly and help make that understanding clearer. So the pull request process gives us a way to put these practices in place and to integrate it in with any sort of automated testing we wanna to have to ensure that our code quality standards are being met. So we've talked a lot about the interactions. A lot of what's in GitHub is two-way conversations, but we may not always want to have to jump into GitHub to look for those conversations to know that they're happening. And to that end, GitHub provides support for notifications where the system can actually let you know when these conversations are happening, when there are things you need to look at, or when you're being mentioned by other team members. You can configure what degree of notification you want to get because if you start getting too many and they're not the right kinds, ultimately you're gonna start ignoring all of them, which then means the notifications serve no value again, the tool supporting the process. 
So notifications give us a way that we can get emails or through integrations with Slack and other systems, notifications where we want to get them that let us know that the conversation is happening. In this case, you can actually see where Dependabot, a security feature in GitHub that I'll talk about in a minute, has actually noticed that I've got an old dependency and that that old dependency had a security risk. To account for that, Dependabot actually went ahead, created a branch, annotated it, that it, it was recommending an upgrade to a new version, compared it to similar upgrades to see what are the percentage of similar upgrades that pass or fail and provided me that context, and submitted it all as a pull request so that I can review it and approve it. And if I've got good test automation in place, because it's a pull request, it's automatically also run through that process. And so I'm getting that end-to-end -end collaboration, and it even begins to go beyond my team to how does the AI and how do the other tools interact with me to make me more effective or to notify the team so we can be proactive instead of reactive. We have a lot of these types of activities, these events, these extensibility points in the overall Git process that help drive us forward. But all of this has to be built on a framework. And what better one than the same framework that's been put together to standardize how we do builds? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if I'm doing a build, it's really a reaction to either a commit, a pull request, or some change in state. And so to that end, GitHub Actions gives us a way to react to changes in state in our repo. That means that at the most basic level, yes, I can create my builds entirely inside of GitHub. They get run either hosted in the cloud on a dynamically provisioned runner that gets wiped as soon as the build is complete. Or optionally, we can opt to integrate into an on-premises runner to run everything behind our firewall, potentially with some restricted access to local resources. The idea with GitHub Actions is they allow us to use YAML to declare what do we want to happen when some event is raised. So when the new code is committed, we're going to run a build. It's gonna run that build on Linux and on Windows and on Mac OS, and it's going to package it and it's gonna place it here. And so this supports our CI and CD processes. But in addition, one of the more powerful aspects is because GitHub raises lots of events and we can trigger on those events as well, it's also possible to implement our workflow processes in here. For example, if I've got an item in the backlog that moves from one state to another, perhaps I wanna run some additional processes to create notifications in outside systems or to implement specific labels or tags on the code so that I can recognize those changes. So beyond thinking of actions as for build or for release, that is CI or CD, we can also think of actions as a way of automating the processes that would normally be manual. All of the APIs available in GitHub are available through actions. The actions process also ties to a global marketplace where you can get open source actions that others have written to specifically perform a number of the tasks that people do day in and day out. Microsoft and GitHub have made numerous tasks available that cover the 80-20 of what most developers want. But for integrations with other systems, there are additional actions available, and they're all, generally speaking, open source. If none of those are good enough, then the underlying action steps themselves you can author, either through Docker images, running code in whatever flavor you prefer on Linux, or through JavaScript. 
You can also compose together multiple common steps into one action, making it easy to configure and standardizing your approach. So actions give us another way that we can better implement DevOps practices that work across our teams. I mentioned that as part of all of this, another area that GitHub provides us is wikis. One of the great things about wikis is they provide a way for us to communicate documentation. Sometimes what the repo represents though is documentation. That is, it could be the, the document itself in the repo as markdown. This could be because we wanna have a website that is all documentation such as Microsoft Docs or GitHub Docs. It could be because we've got needs for certain static content that we want to make available to our end consumers, which is very common with government sites. It's a lot of standard uh, approaches, business practices, documentation about how they do things day to day. And to support all that, GitHub has GitHub pages. This allows you to very quickly and easily put markdown files in a repository, version control them, and have them automatically pushed out to a website, which GitHub manages and keeps up for free. And so your markdown files become web pages. GitHub provides a lot of this functionality out of the box. You don't even have to build actions to fully support it. But for developers who wanna take total control over the documentation, its format, how it's built out, you actually have access through actions to be able to customize the entire workflow. And so this becomes part of a holistic practice that includes how do I document what I'm doing or how do I provide documentation on my process or products to others? An additional feature that's in GitHub that I wanted to devote uh, a separate uh, discussion to is the new advanced security offerings. As we mentioned before, a lot of our security vulnerabilities end up coming through third-party code that's been compromised or that has bugs in it that have been observed and are being exploited. These advisories are being generated every day, in some cases, hundreds of times in a day. GitHub now brings all of those together and allows you to have that integrated through Dependabot directly into your repos. Dependabot, as I mentioned before, makes it very easy for GitHub to notify you when the third-party packages you depend on in your code. For developers, that means it's in packages JSON, it's part of your NuGet package definitions, it's a Maven package you've referenced. Whatever type of packages it is, Dependabot will compare the version and name of the package, if it's a public one, with a list of known CVEs against packages and versions, and it will identify what is the recommended remediation that's associated with that exploit. When that occurs, Dependabot can also optionally go beyond notifying you to actually create a pull request that contains a commit of code that will make all of those changes for you, and which which uh, includes the release notes, change log, and details around that version so that you can understand what's changed. A compatibility score will also make it very easy for you to identify, based on what they've seen in similar recommendations, how many public repositories, when they were updated, that was all that was required for a successful build. So you can get some idea of the risk of taking the update before you take it. Coupled with an active CI CD process that tests your code, this can make it very easy to make sure you're always using the latest version of third-party dependencies to reduce risk. An additional part of the overall advanced security package goes beyond looking at just your software supply chain. It actually looks at your code to identify potential exploits and allows you to take uh, potential exploits that security research have, researchers have identified 
and managing that as code, analyze your code base to examine those exploits. That functionality is called CodeQL. CodeQL is essentially a programming language coupled with a database built around your code that examines your code, looking for paths through the code that are exploitable or create a security vulnerability. When the SolarWinds exploit was identified, within a very short time, CodeQL scripts were made available to the community, which could examine your code base to look for code or dependencies, which could represent an active exploit by SolarWinds or as part of that SolarWinds exploit attack. And so the CodeQL process will utilize uh, code that you can write, which essentially analyzes the graph of your code to determine, is there a path which handles a specific exploit, which you would define what that exploit looks like in terms of high-level coding. So in this case, it examines uh, a simple converter class that's just creating an output stream and uh, or an input stream and reading it. And it's observing that because of the unsafe input, there's a path through the underlying Java framework in which ultimately someone could deserialize exploitable, uh, potentially exploitable code. And so I could deserialize things blindly and without further checks and further analysis, I might be exposing my users to risk. So Q Code QL, which is part of the advanced security offering, gives us additional features where we can go beyond the supply chain to make sure that the code base itself is being examined for vulnerabilities based on known exploits and best practices. And because it's all code, we can implement this into our process, customize it, enhance it, and it becomes just another part of that build and release process that ensures the integrity of our code base. Now, again, as we've gone through this, DevOps is a lot of collaboration. You've heard a lot of ways that we're supporting this at different levels. From the time you create the plan all the way through to how does the code get pushed out? And ideally, how do you bring the feedback from that back in to advise your plans? Part of this functionality is directly addressed, that monitoring phase, through GitHub Insights which gives us some visibility into what's happening in the code base, how our code is changing, how people are contributing over time, the way the code's being branched, who's got access to copies, how many branches do we have and who created them and how long did they live? All of these various metrics and aspects allow us to directly look at how is the code base being used and how are the team working together to contribute to it? We get visibility through this into how to be a more effective team and how to understand which of the projects within the company are getting the most churn, either because they've got the most customer activity versus a dead project, or because we've got the most focus on it, either to support customers with new features or to support them because there's more issues that have to be resolved. By having the ability to examine these insights about your code base, the team's interactions, the flow through all the issues and commits, we can make informed decisions as to whether or not the team is effectively applying both agile practices and core DevOps concepts. This is an additional feature that GitHub provides to give you that level of visibility and to make sure that you can then turn around and act on it. As I mentioned earlier, when you couple all of these different pieces together, including things like actions, we can have an end-to-end -end strategy that ultimately makes it very easy for us to act on these things proactively. And so with that, we've kind of walked through an overview of the different pieces of GitHub itself that can support your DevOps environment and that can help your team to be more effective 
in implementing DevOps practices and processes using GitHub. So uh, with this, I'm now gonna uh, turn my attention over to some of the questions that have been raised during this, uh, in, during today's session. And that way we can go ahead and get you some answers to some of the questions you have. If any of you have additional questions, please make sure to uh, enter them in now so that we can get them answered. And if you have questions that you'd like to bring to us privately, please reach out to consulting at winelect.com or training at winelect.com. And we'd be glad to set up a time with you to talk to you privately about the particular challenge you're facing and how you might be able to move forward with your DevOps practices using GitHub and other tools that are available. All right. Uh, so first question, uh, the discussion on issues, templates, et cetera, looks very similar to what Azure DevOps has. A good overlap between GitHub and Azure DevOps. Does Microsoft have any plan to merge the two or move more toward GitHub? So that's a, a wonderful question and a really good observation. Behind the scenes, the two teams are actually one and the same. Microsoft acquired GitHub, and the same team that created Azure DevOps became part of the overall GitHub team, looking at a unified way to create DevOps experiences. So think of many of these features in GitHub as being a v-next of what's been created in Azure DevOps. In fact, starting with Actions. Actions is actually the based on the same code that Azure DevOps use, uses today for its build pipelines, but enhanced, given better support for open source and community activities, and further improved. Similarly, some of the features you're going to start seeing in issues are a vNext enhancement of some of the functionality that exists today in Azure DevOps. We do have a session that we do periodically for those interested, where we actually bring GitHub, Microsoft, and Winelect all together, and we discuss what does that combined future look like if you're using one of the products or looking to use all of them. And to that, I'll add that none of these products are dead, that none of them are decommissioned. They're slowly coming together over time uh, and becoming part of the overall GitHub offering. But because first and foremost, both of those products are integration platforms, GitHub and Azure DevOps can be seamlessly integrated. So you can pick and choose which of the features and functionality in either of these you'd like to have while these transformations are taking place. So if you prefer the boards and backlogs in Azure DevOps or its approach to uh, release management, not a problem, integrate seamlessly. And to that end, even other tools like Jira, Octopus, Jenkins, all can be integrated seamlessly with one or both of those products. And so whatever tool set supports your process, this can be part of that solution, especially if you're thinking about the security enhancements that it brings to the repository workflow. So yes, it's a great observation that all of this looks really similar. And it's because it's the same people trying to figure out how to make your jobs easier and how to bring you more value as a customer through their own DevOps life cycles. Uh, next question, uh, what steps do you recommend for getting started with DevOps? And what kind of roles do you suggest for implementing DevOps? Uh, that's a very complex question but ultimately it always starts with understanding the people and the process. It is frequently driven from the bottom down, but requires support, or from the bottom up, but requires support from the top down. DevOps is as much a mindset as integrating together the different parts of the teams. Many times the developers are very well positioned to help bring everything together because they live it day in, day out. If there's a QA team involved, they see another part of it where the disconnects and uh, in and around quality control impact the process. 
with the operations team, if they're separate and siloed, can we start talking about infrastructure as code so they can see the changes you're proposing and directly contribute to the code and the automation of how it's deployed themselves? But at the from the very beginning, it starts with first getting an understanding of what do these practices look like, then examining what do the people and processes you're using look like, and then how do we take steps, no matter how small, to get towards where we want to be? Because at the end of the day, change doesn't happen instantly. We've seen that with code. Instead, decide on one change to make for the next sprint that can be an easy way to immediately start applying new practices. If it brings you value, then at the end of that sprint, examine are there other areas that you could change to bring value? If it doesn't bring value, look at why. Does it need a change? Is it not the right change for the team? Does the team need training? When you combine all these pieces together, you can start to roll out change over time. You don't have to make a big bang to still have a big impact. Uh, what is the difference between GitLabs and GitHub? Uh, essentially, those are two other or two competing products in the same space. Uh, that could warrant a, a discussion and a webinar of its own just in the features and differences uh, that come as part of GitLab. GitHub is the leader in this space. And uh, GitHub, much like Azure DevOps, is part of uh, the Microsoft family. And so it supports uh, features with a lot of native integrations between cloud technologies and the other Microsoft technologies. At the end of the day, both offerings are built around Git. Both offerings provide you uh, forms of lifecycle management and process control but each one takes slightly different approaches in how they provide that to you. And so each one uh, can bring a lot of value to the team if used correctly and if it can support the processes you're trying to implement. But essentially, it's two very independent products. The next question, uh, suppose I have dozens of small programs I want to store and get. It seems the options are, store each project in its own repository, or copy all projects into a common folder and put them in a common repository. I either end up with lots of small repos or lots of unrelated projects together in a single repository. What's the best way to handle this? Um, another great question. Uh, thank you for that one. So the idea with Get is because we can iterate and make changes quickly. Typically speaking, most teams will make each one of those utility projects its own independent piece. That allows you to track issues to it, contribute to it, work on it independently. And yes, in that case, you do end up with lots of small projects, and in many cases, a need for either clear uh, naming conventions or a clear way to address those. There are several techniques in Git you can use to create visibility to all of those at once, but ultimately, if each one changes independently, a repo for each one can add a lot of value by allowing you to manage change on each independently. So yes, that is one option. And if you couple that with a release practice through package management or package distribution processes, you can make those utility programs available as a combined whole from all of the individual repos. So you can say, hey, I just want to get the latest compiled version of all of these. You've probably already guessed, because those processes are all raising events, GitHub Actions can help coordinate that so that even if you're using small individual repos, you can bring them together and make those binaries available in a singular uh, fashion for everyone. The other format, as you mentioned, is the mono repo, putting them all in one repository. And yes, that then means that as you branch and as you work, each one of those is changing, uh, or the code is changing 
in a place that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that all of those utilities have changed. There are ways you can build those independently, even within that with filters. Uh, the, the con to that, as you mentioned, is that uh, coupling that exists where you've got a lot of unrelated features together. Uh, the pro is that sometimes it's an easy way for people to get started. But ultimately, under the covers, uh, that is one big difference between Git and a centralized version control is you don't have branching at the folder level. It all exists at the repository level. There are a few other procedures you can use, orphan submodules, to manage things independently. But generally speaking, uh, you've identified the two leading ways that we recommend most companies look at the problem. Uh, if you get a more specific use case, glad to discuss it and see how we could help you to chart a path through that. Uh, finally, the last question for today. I'd like to know if it's okay to move and maintain our legacy documents from SharePoint to GitHub for ease of accessibility enhancements. Or are we supposed to only keep text files in GitHub? So you absolutely can store other types of documents in GitHub. That said, GitHub really is designed for collaboration frequently around text documents, uh, though images and such obviously are part of that overall lifecycle in most cases. You can store documents from SharePoint in GitHub, but of course, some of the functionality like diffing becomes a bit more challenging without third-party tools because being binary files, it looks at it the same way it would look at it if it was an image file. There are tools that can help with this, but that's the area where SharePoint really shines. If your documents are PowerPoint, Word, those kinds of documents where it's a binary file format, SharePoint gives you revision control, history, the ability to diff, the ability to even put permissions down on individual files. And so it serves a very different niche. SharePoint allows you to, to have that more advanced level of uh, document management and sharing that Git wasn't really designed from the, from the outcome or from the uh, inception to handle. SharePoint also integrates natively into all the Office products and a number of third-party products, which means that when we integrate SharePoint in, we can manage, revision, edit, collaborate on the files together all at the same time in one space. Unfortunately, that's another area where Git repositories just don't support you fully yet, and they're really not designed to solve that problem, which is concurrent editing of binary files like Word docs or PowerPoints so that you can be highly collaborative. SharePoint was designed to handle that, and so it definitely excels in that. I will offer that one thing we do see, especially uh, in the government sector or with uh, businesses that are moving to better adoption of Git, is a trend to look at how many of those documents, especially Word docs such as processes, still need to exist as Word files. If they don't need to exist in Word, then changing them to being markdown files, text documents, can make a lot more sense because it enables collaboration, revision, and publishing, all from a single location with branching and uh, process management support, including pull requests to control the process. We've seen a number of customers take Word documents, decompose them into markdown files. The teams will collaborate on them. And when the changes are approved by all the appropriate parties, they get pushed out to a website. We also see that customers in those cases will sometimes take advantage of GitHub Actions. So now beyond just pushing it to a website, the markdown files can be pushed out as a PDF file or a Word document, making download quick and easy. If you're familiar with a lot of the, the documentation sites that GitHub and Microsoft have created over the years, you'll really see this pattern in use. And you'll see where Microsoft, for example, with the Azure Docs, 
enables the community to even directly comment on, annotate, and modify the documents, making it quick and easy for them to keep the documents up to date and to take advantage of the broader community knowledge to improve and correct issues that may exist in their documents. So if you're thinking of that kind of move, that's where GitHub could really excel because the Git repos would really foster the collaboration on those kind of documents and make that process very quick and easy. And so with that, we have now reached the end of all the questions. Uh, as a reminder, you'll be getting links to this uh, following today's session. Uh, the video will be made available. If you have questions you'd like to get answered one-on-one, -on -one, please reach out to training at winelect.com or consulting at winelect.com. Either one will make sure that your questions get answered and your problems get addressed, and that if you've got something you're uh, trying to figure out how to do, we'll be glad to give you the advice to get you started. Thank you all very much for attending today's session. I really hope you found it informative, and thanks for all the great questions. We look forward to seeing you in the next webinar.